There are too many things happening on the sands of a prison's coliseum floor for the stranger or novice to survive. The weak body or dull and unprepared mind surrounded by the ever-present mass of hostile bodies and feral scent of danger can quickly lose its strength of will to act on natural impulse. I can't help but laugh at the false bravado of certain prison guards. They sit high above in their ivory tower of complacency, staring down with twisted, sneering lips of contempt at the waste products of humanity in the arena of heartache, desperation, and despair below, observing the physical abuse and horrors without truly understanding the reality of the very world they so gleefully impose upon their fellow man. That is, until one day, during the course of an uprising, they somehow fall from their perch of safety on the wall to the bloody sands of the arena below, finding themselves in a totally frightening and alien world they have never seen before. Then, for the first time in their lives, they find themselves looking beyond the scarred, time-hardened faces whose eyes betray no sign of compassion or empathy in search of that one sensitive and forgiving heart whose sense of humanity has stood the test of hell on earth and will deliver them in spite of their own sins against humanity. Many times during my 35 years of incarceration, I have looked into such eyes of dawning recognition. Some are weak and cowardly, others strong and determinedly proud, but all aware of their sudden precarious mortality, a prisoner's daily fare in the arena. Hello, their hearts whisper silently. I know now, I understand your plight, as I have never had before. I love my wife and my sons as you love yours. I do not want to die here, not like this. Can you, will you help me? And my soul would capitulate, but not without the awareness that I would need the aid and support of others. In prison, Loyalty has a lifespan that lasts only as long as a common self-interest exists. Honor exists solely when victory can be tasted on one's palate. But there are exceptions. Friends and equals of mind and soul, sharing something that transcends even barriers of racial, ethnic, and religious prejudices. Friends of kindred spirits, who share not only like principles, but more so the laughter and tears and fears that make an otherwise hideous existence bearable. Men who will die with you because the fear of losing you would be tantamount to losing one's own sense of self. That simple veneer of human pride and dignity that one clings to after all thoughts and hopes of a shared common civility between antagonists has been banished from the platter. Now, as I sit in my cell in April of 1994, feeling like some old damned fool, I look around me and see that nothing has changed since I first heard a steel door clang shut behind me when I was a young fool in 1954. When I was paroled from Clinton in 1975, after my escape from Attica in 1971, I was 36 years old and considered myself very fortunate to have received the parole so soon after that escape. The fact that I became heavily involved in the educational programs available in prisons for the first time in all my years of incarceration, my growth was conducive to the parole board rendering a favorable decision. Although the reason for my seeking more intellectual pursuits was not particularly a noble one, for the past 20 years in prison, I had been doing my time lifting weights and playing softball and football while using the hours in my cell of reading or writing rather than becoming involved in evening programs that required classroom situations. In my eyes, that spelled unnecessary exposure to the herd and the possibility of random confrontations. But at 34 years old, the weights seemed to get heavier and the aches and pains from football games didn't wear off until the end of the season. That strongly suggested it was time for me to accept the passing years gracefully and seek a gentler form of entertainment 
to occupy the endless hours that weigh heavily upon one's mind in an 8 by 10 cell, it feels more like an incubator after a couple of decades. I had been in the drama class, which came in from Potsdam University three afternoons a week. I found it extremely stimulating and enjoyable. Some months later in 1973, I joined a photography class at the insistence of my good friend Al Haber. I'd spent endless hours in the darkroom learning the art of developing black and white film. But in spite of all this, I still had three evenings a week in my cell with nothing to do, and a guy can only do so much reading before he burns out. How I came to find relief and fill in those three non-productive evenings came about in the most surprising manner, but one that would give me more gratification than anything else I had ever been involved in, including sports. It was a Friday afternoon, and I had just come from the drama class with a load of books under my arm. We had been rehearsing Eugene O'Neill's The Moon for the Misbegotten. But I also had football practice. Rather than returning to my cell to drop off the books, I went directly to the yard and left the books on a bench on the sideline close to the football field. In reality, the field was no more than 100 yards of hard-packed dirt, which we called the rock garden, as after each heavy rain, a new crop of jagged slate rock seemed to spring up, making each step or fall a deadly venture. I'd walked down to the far end of the bench to talk to my friends, Jip and Sal Cangano, our quarterback, about plays we'd be running in preparation for a playoff game the following day. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw Jack the Iceman. He was a 270-pound defense tackle sitting on the bench looking through the books I had left there. When I finished putting down my cleats and knee pads over my pants, I walked over to him. See anything you like, Jack? I asked, thinking maybe he found something interesting. I wasn't prepared for his startled look and stuttering response nor how he quickly put the books down as if he had been caught stealing something. Oh, no. No, I was just looking. This gentle giant, until the whistle blew, muttered softly. You like Eugene O'Neill, I asked? Who's Eugene O'Neill? He asked almost defensively. The playwright, the guy in the book you were just browsing through. I, God damn, how ignorant can I be, I thought, looking at him standing there with his head bowed, he was a guy I thought I knew for the better part of 10 years, one of the best chess players in the joint. I was tongue-tied. I can't read, Sully. He looked down at me defiantly with tears in his eyes, looking up and down the bench thinking he had been heard. You can read, Jack, I said softly, confused as to how to handle his volatile mood. I said, I can't read, he almost shouted as if I were suggested he were lying. Hey, relax. I smiled. I know you can't read at this moment. What I meant was you can learn to read. You're not one of the better chess players in the joint because you're a mental retard. I can't play chess, Jack. But it's not because I'm too dumb to learn. I just never had a real interest. Football has always been my chess game. Obviously, you have a reason and an interest to learn now because it's eating you up inside. What is it? I've got a daughter, Sully. She's eight years old, writes me every week, and is hurt because I don't write her back. So why not go to school, Jack? I can't. He shook his head. I feel like a big dummy sitting there, and if anybody said something, well, you know the outcome of what that would be. I just thought, you know, seeing your books and that you were one of those tutors with the Literacy Volunteers of America program. You know, they started here. You know, they teach guys one-on-one. -on -one. His voice trailed off dejectedly. Would it make a difference if I was one of them, Jack? Yeah, I felt I could trust you. What's trust got to do with it, Jack? You know how most of these assholes are. They ain't happy unless they got somebody to put down or laugh at. The whistle blew for practice, and we stood there looking at each other. Listen, Jack, I said, coming to a firm decision. 
I ain't no fucking genius or some pseudo intellectual, and I don't belong to the literary volunteers program. But if you care that much about your daughter and you're willing to swallow that stupid pride that's been choking you up for years and you really want to learn, then I'll sign up as a tutor Monday morning. Is it a deal? Jack was too emotionally wound up to answer without crying, but simply shook his head affirmatively. Let's go play ball, student. I smiled. I teach. He smiled good naturedly. My time with Jack and eventually others was truly a gratifying feeling. And after 10 months, Jack had made great gains. He went from a third grade level of reading to a seventh. My greatest reward came in the form of a letter Jack showed me from his daughter, telling him how much it meant to her to hear from her daddy. Jesus H. Christ, I exclaimed, thrusting the letter at him in mock disgust. I can't stand this tear-jerking crap. Though we both grinned misty-eyed in awe of simple human communication between ourselves as well as his little girl, I can honestly say that my plans upon being released were good ones. All I thought about were a decent job, a good woman, and a couple of kids to enjoy the remainder of my life with. Well, I have no excuses, as I had all a man could ask of life, including two good kids in Kenny Jackson and Ramsey Clark, they did everything humanly possible to redirect 25 years of arrested development. They never failed me. I failed myself. I also failed a woman that many men dream of having but never know, my wife, Gail. She brought two beautiful boys into my world, making her love a threefold treasure that should have sated the emotional needs of any man. Her words haunt me now how she implored me time and again, Joe, you've made enough waves in your life. I want you to be here to help guide your sons through the troubled waters they will face in theirs. My God, life is not a game. And that was it in a nutshell. Life for me in prison for the 25 years prior to my meeting Gail had been just that, a game. I just didn't know how or was too selfish or too frightened to switch gears. I think I preferred being a big fish in the microcosm of life's pond that is prison than to being relegated to the insignificant status of a guppy in the ocean of sharks I saw and felt around me on the outside. The only way I felt I could maintain my former status quo was to apply the only trade I had years of training in, violence and surviving in the arena.